and we'll begin with the announcements. Are we good? The, the uh, big announcement is next week we're going to be back at church um, because uh, Linda has a party here for her whole family next weekend. Ooh. So um, <laughs> a great time for them, but we, we need to be, uh, to, to be back at church. And I know we've used the barn in previous years. I don't think since I've been here. It's very funny. Um, it's just it's easier with all the equipment if we just head back to the sanctuary. Other people said, oh, can't we go in the barn? And I'm like, um, yeah, let's just go back. <laughs> so, um, um, but that's our last plan time. After that, it'll just be because of rain. We'll be back. Um, I think that's all the announcements. We're, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, of course, oops, one more. Allie. Can I just do a quick advertisement? I'm running a retreat um, for artists, but anybody at Pilgrim Lodge in June 6th through 9th. And I need July. July. Yeah. We didn't have it in June. Um, and I need about five more people. So if anybody wants to get away, have somebody else do all your cooking, sleeping in a cabin, going on to the waterfront and just doing whatever you want. That's the retreat for you. Talk to me. Thank you, Allie. That's a great offering, which I'm going to take a part of. Yay, team. <laughs> so, um, all right. Then just the final thing um, that we'll kind of keep talking about, of course, too, um, is this week of decisions that we've had. Um, the first one, you know, that came down, of course, had to do with us in Maine, um, that everyone was talking about with uh, funding, using public funding for um, a religious schools, private religious schools. And um, that, again, is just going to open the floodgates to um, to a lot of different things, I'm afraid, as we were, um, as we, I think we said last week when we were in the pride parade, um, right behind us was the group for the separation of church and state. And I thought, oh, that's good. Oh, I'm glad you're here, you know, because um, we forget it is um, not only that the, um, that the, uh, the state can't tell us um, what church to belong to, you know, to, to make, it's an establishment clause, as they say, um, which I'm afraid is what leads us to um, what happened on Friday. Well, Thursday was the guns. Um, and when you, when it, when that decision, you put that decision next to the Friday decision about us losing um, Roe v. Wade, um, as you've seen, the, and the signs and it's really come down to that, that now guns in America have more rights than women who, or people who can bear children. Um, so there's a lot more choice when you own a gun rather than um, whether you can um, become a parent or not. So this is a difficult thing. I was at the um, uh, Pride, uh, the Pride, listen to me, at the march, um, the protest march on Sunday. Um, the main council of churches wanted ministers there. And I was there with my stole on, which you all don't see very often. Um, but it is actually, it's a red stole and it's from the UCC and it's the God is still speaking and has the big comma in it. Um, and so there were a group of us there and then a couple, um, uh, Jared, who's the uh, rabbi in Portland, he, he spoke. And then um, one of the uh, priests from um, St. Luke spoke too. And this is going to be something that we're going to need to keep being a part of um, and on uh, because it is true. The thing, the reason um, it's not only the last Sunday of Pride Month, that's why the flags are everywhere, too. Um, and we'll we'll speak and sing as we do this week. Um, but also um, the words that we heard that they're going to go that they are already they have already targeted our trans siblings and are going to keep doing that. Um, but that all the privacy um, things that are hooked on that 14th Amendment are going down, which will affect a lot of us and all of us. And if it affects one of us, it affects all of us. Um, so uh, we have a lot ahead of us. And um, we are the congregation. We are one of the congregations to do that, the people to, to be a part of that. Um, and I just want to thank you, too, um, that I have, and, and I'm so grateful that I have the freedom to go do this on your behalf and don't, and, and with you, not just on your behalf too, but I don't have to worry about losing my job. Um, some of the other churches I've worked for, I would have to um, be making other plans um, if I did some of this, um, including UCC churches um, that I've worked for, or they would have told me just, can you just be quiet? Like, just don't talk about it. And I'm tired of just not talking about things. Um, so, um, so if you can find a, a recording and they're out there of the, the march that happened in Portland on Friday night, the guy from the Small Business Association was excellent. 
And he said, you know, why are we afraid of talking about two things, sex and abortion? And he says, and I'm going to talk about both. And, you know, the whole crowd erupted. Um, but he, he, he really hit it, that when we keep quiet about things, um, we cede our power to someone else. And that is what has happened again. So let's be a, an out loud <laughs> congregation on this. So let's gather together. And in the midst of all that is now and all that we can be, let's worship together. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you come with and wherever you are going, you are seen, you are heard, you are welcome, you have always belonged. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land on their own land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge these lands upon which we worship as the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy, of the Indakana people. We commit ourselves to the work of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And please stand if you're able and let's sing together, oh, for a world. Gracious God, we do cast our vision, a vision of a world that you call us to, where all are included and all are loved, where all may choose the vision for their lives, and all may have the opportunity to love who they love. Gracious God, let us not just think that that is the future goal. Let us work on making that happen now in every place and everywhere and every way that we can. Let us hear your call to, you, to your love. All this we ask in your name. Amen. If you're standing, you may be seated. Our, we're um, embarking on um, a journey now through September on the stories of healing. And um, I picked for the two this week, um, stories of people blind that were healed. Of course, and one of my favorites is Blind Bartimaeus um, that we're gonna read in that too. I think I love him because um, I always had this picture of him being sent out every day to go sit. He had his place somewhere where he sat and begged. And, um, and that I could just see the way that he, he's talked about in this story, that instead of thinking that he was an outcast, he decided that he had a really important job every day and that he was going to do what he was going to do. And he was going to hold his piece of the earth and his place there. And that he was going to cry out when he needed to cry out. And he was going to listen. I think um, I have a feeling Blind Bartimaeus was the consummate eavesdropper 
I think he knew everyone's secrets because um, almost like servants used to be where people used to talk in front of them, you know, and everything, everybody just ignored him. And, and it was like he was invisible, but his hearing was, you know, 800 times as good as the rest of ours. Um, so I always think of him as this really amazing person. And so when I found this, um, this poem this week called Blind Boone's Vision, about a child asking his mother, I think it's a he, um, about, uh, about his eyes. And I love um, these first lines. When I got old enough to ask my mother, to her surprise, to tell me what she did with my eyes. And what a way to think about that. Um, anyone who's interacted with children know that that their logic and thought patterns are not ours and ours weren't either and those are, are either taught out of us or we become more logical right and sometimes we need to go back and think of different ways so we can hear new things so let's listen to uh, his vision that he has so if you would ground yourself with your feet on whatever ground you are on, be that grassy or the floors in your house and your seat in the seat that you have chosen today. And find your breathing. When I got old enough, I asked my mother, to her surprise, to tell me what she did with my eyes. She balked and stalled, sounding unsure for the first time I could remember. It was the tender way she held my face and kissed where tears should have rolled that told me I'd asked of her the almost impossible. To recount my blinding tale to tell what became of the rest of me. She took me by the hand and led me to a small sapling that stood not much taller than me. I could smell the green marrow of its promise reaching free of the soil like a song from earth's royal dirty mouth. Then mother told me how she, newly freed, had prayed like a slave through that night when the surgeon took my eyes to save my fevered life. Then got off her knees come morning to take the severed parts of me for burial right there beneath that tree. They fed the roots, climbed through its leaves to soak in sunshine, sunlight. So she told me, I can see. When the wind rustles up and cools me down, when the earth shakes with footsteps and when the sound of bird calls stirs forests like the black and white bustling neath my fingertips, I am of the light and shade of my tree. Now, ask me how tall that tree of mine has grown to be after all this time. It touches a place between heaven and here. And I shudder when I hear the earth's winds through my bones, through the bones of that boxed up swarm of wood, bird and bee. I let it loose and beyond me.
Loving God, forgive us when we think that seeing only happens with our eyes. Expand our hearts so that we may see through our hearts. Let us see the connection that we have to all that is around us. And let us let that teach us how to see as you do. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering.
Thank you so much, Eric. Can I have the children forward, please? <clears throat> There's a bunch of them. You know what? Come, come on and sit down on the grass first, and then we'll do and then we can do that at the end. Hi, Walter. How are you? I thought, Amy, you were probably here somewhere. I didn't think maybe you were driving yourself to church this morning or anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know what? Oh, let's see. What do you think? You think I can do this? I think so. Yep. I got a bum knee. That's the problem. But do you guys ever lose something in your house? Like, you know, you've seen it and you just have no idea where it is, right? What do you usually do when that happens? freak out. Okay, after you freak out, which I understand completely. <laughs> you keep looking for it. Do you go and look for it in the places that you've already looked for it? Or do you try new places? Do you try new places? Because I keep going back to the old ones for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. What do you do when you just can't find it? You can't find it. Do you ever ask maybe one of your parents, like, have you seen or somebody else, right? And have you ever had this experience where they go, yeah, I have, done that too. have you done that too yet? And then they go, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> have you ever done that where it's like, it's right in front of your nose, basically? That's what my mother always said, you know? Looking in the oh, and was it there? Yes. Oh, you did find it, huh? Oh, that's good. Well, I've had that happen before where it's like right in front of your face, right? You know, and you're just like, oh, how did I miss this, right? My blankie that I oh, you lost your blankie. That's an important thing to have, isn't it? Yeah. Well, sometimes we do that. It's like we're suddenly blind to it, right? As you get older, and well, some of you are already in school, and you know when you have to go over your paper to see if you've made any mistakes or something you've written, and you can't find the mistake, somebody else could like this, but you can't find it because you've looked at it too much, right? As you get older, you'll find that with your own writing, you're, you have to pass it off to somebody else. They call it proofreading it because you're like, I can't even see this anymore. Like your brain just makes it right, even if it's wrong. That's what that's why we have good proofreaders. You'll have a friend who's a very good proofreader. Everyone does, unfortunately, <laughs> but that's really important. But that's it's kind of like you're suddenly blind, isn't it? Well, we are going to have two stories today about two guys who were blind. They couldn't see and it looks like from the story as best i can guess they both became blind like something happened um there's illnesses that can do that sometimes they weren't just born blind because some people are born blind right it's where they can't see but they had some kind of illness and they just didn't have the stuff we can do now like if you're blind now we've got you know like your phone can talk to you right um, there's programs that if you type something into the pro program it can read it back to you it reads it back to you out loud well, they didn't have computers back there, did they? And they didn't have, it even says in one of our stories that somebody had to bring the person to Jesus because they wouldn't have known how to get there, right? They, they, couldn't, they couldn't see, you know? But sometimes we're like that. Some things are right in front of our faces and we still can't see it, right? And sometimes that's things like somebody that we need to be really kind to. Have you thought about that? Like you got him from school or somewhere and you're like, oh, that person was really having a bad day. I should have said something kind to him, right? Yeah, that's kind of like it's right in front of your face and you're just blind to it, right? It, and it's kind of like our hearts are blind. But the wonderful thing about that is, is God says, you know what? Just do it tomorrow. Do it the next time you see it. Just like the, the guys in our story, Jesus actually, oh, it was funny, in the first story, Jesus, well, first he spits on his hand, and then he puts that spit on the guy's eyes. Nice, huh? Like, Jesus, could you, we all know now with COVID, like, oh, no, don't do that, Jesus, right? Right. But he did, and, the, and the, Jesus said, so how'd it go? And the guy's like, well, um, I think they're people, but they look like walking trees, that's why I have that blurry picture of the trees on the, the bulletin this morning, right? So sometimes we see it well, right? And then Jesus touched his eyes again. And, and, the, and it says the guy had to look intently. Do you know what intently means? It means when you look really hard, you're, you're very focused on it. That was, that's what being intent is. And he had to look really intently and then he could see well. 
And sometimes we have to do that, don't we? We have to be really intentional. We have to really focus and say, you know what? Even tomorrow, I'm going to be kind to that person, whether they're having a good day or a bad day. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to make sure I do it. And that's all the ways that we are God's love. It doesn't, they don't sound terribly important, you know, right? We didn't fix world peace or anything like that, but they are important every time we do it. Okay. Before we pray, grace is finishing third grade or has finished third grade, which means she gets her Bible. So actually, can all of you stand up? Yeah, and when you're in third grade, you get a Bible too. How do you like that? So Grace, if you turn around. And I want you guys around her too. <laughs> so everybody can see. But this is the Bible that we give all the, the, the kids that have finished um, third grade, because we think now is the time you don't have to borrow anybody else's. <laughs> you can read it when you want. Um, and you can find out new things in it that maybe we didn't see. And you can teach us just as we still teach you, <laughs> I hope, all right? And what I'd love you guys to do is usually when we, when we give something to someone or do this, um, it's called a blessing also too. And one thing that we do with blessing is we put hands on people. So would you guys put a hand on, um, on Grace's shoulder? Look, your sister's touching you and she's not hitting you. Isn't that good? Uh, so can you guys come over here and just, yeah, there you go. Can you put a, a hand on Grace somewhere? You, you guys know Grace, there you go. Okay, so you guys are doing part of the blessing while I pray. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we have these wonderful milestones in our lives and we achieve things and are ready for the next thing. We have here Grace who's finished third grade now and is ready for a new adventure. And we've given her these words that she's been learning for many years, but now they're hers to hold and read. God, not only be in those words, but be in Grace's heart as she hears them and grows into your person of love. All this we ask in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you all. You can head over with the toys if you want. With Kaya? Okay. Oh, yeah. Hold this, right? <laughs> Our stories this morning are both from the book of Mark, and we're reading them in the order that they are that they appear in Mark two. So this first one, and then the second one, and I, I think we're seeing like Jesus trying out a way of healing kind of thing, and it doesn't go well, and he does better the second time too. So, so we'll begin in Mark eight. They, Jesus and the disciples, whoever was following him that day, came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man to him and begged Jesus to touch him. He, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And the man looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him away to his home and saying, don't go to the village. And then later on, Jesus and the people following him came to Jericho. And you know that trip to Jericho was dangerous. And he, as he and his disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. 
And when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered Bartimaeus to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called to the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. Jesus is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and he followed Jesus on the way. May God bless these words to our living. It's always a good day when I get to read Blind Bartimaeus. I love that story. He is such a great, oh my goodness. And I just feel so lucky that he must have been twice as much of a character as we see him in this story. Because of all these years, we've still got quite a character in these stories. It's just so interesting that for this Sunday, I chose blind the stories of blind we're going to be doing a different theme deaf you know hunger all these different healings um over the next weeks and um a lot of ministers are writing this week um about the lectionary that we would have had if i decided to follow that which i decided not to and there's a great piece in it it is the the fruit of the spirit you know for because and we all forget it's from galatians um that right before the fruit of the spirit they list everything that you're not supposed to do like licentiousness i mean it's great there's great words in there right and then they come to but what you should be doing the fruits of the spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control but i had selected blind and i'll have to admit at 10 11 on friday morning i felt blinded by rage and then it went to blinded by disappointment and instead of um well i listened to a lot this week and still am listening to a lot but the thing that kept coming back to me was the thing that i and so many have lost and we all have lost in this is freedom and I saw that uh, one person that I go back to again and again, I've mentioned here before is Tim Snyder, who's a, a history prof at Yale, just soft-spoken, wonderful guy who's, who's, um, who's center of his work all these years has been Ukraine and Russia and Eastern Europe um, and talk about for such a time as this, as he has. But I was listening again to some of his um, words on freedom and his definition of freedom is that we're individuals with different values, thinking about our individual and a multitude of futures. He thinks of freedom as future. And I was blinded by rage and disappointment because futures have now been eliminated for many, and I suspect many more yet to come. We all have different values. And now we're all being forced to have certain values, to only think of those. And when I looked back at the, you know, the stories, I thought, which of these blind people am I? Am I this first one who was brought, who was led? He didn't, couldn't get there on his own. He had to have a friends bring him. I don't even know how much maybe they told him about this healer, this Jesus. Had just friends decided to do it? Did you notice it wasn't even family? It was just, it, friends brought him to that. And there he was. And, I, and I, I think about him and the kind of blindness he probably had. I've, I changed my beginning, so I'm ditching my notes. That's the way it goes today. Um, 
I, I thought about his blindness, that both of them were not blind from birth. Some of the other um, blind stories in the Bible are blind from birth. And there's always a problem when you have blind from birth. That means that, there, that there's a sin of the parents that that child is carrying. That's how they considered it. But these two are men, they're saying adults, but they've been, they've, they're, they're somehow blind. And so they're, they're not on their own. They're not fully integrated into the life of the community. But this one has friends. That, that they weren't afraid of his blindness, that they were kind to him, and that they brought him to this place. And then I find what's so interesting is that Jesus leads him out of town. Did you hear that? And I, picture that. That's what I do a lot with these stories. Um, I, I don't know whether I was taught that or whatever, but from I, always a young age, it was always about picturing them, not just the little pictures that the David C. Cook gave you for Sunday school material, right? You know, that still haunt me to this day. Thank you. Um, but I, I, I really thought of that this time, that here these, these people, and did you hear they just wanted Jesus to touch him? That's all. Just, just touch him, Jesus. Like the, the friends even had some idea that this could be fixed this way. But, but Jesus did more than touch him. He took his hand and he led him outside of the, the town. Now, why? I don't think Jesus was embarrassed. I actually think if, if Jesus was embarrassed, it wasn't about the fact that this man was blind. It's that Jesus didn't know how this was going to go. And it's captured in the story that it didn't go well the first time, did it? You know, we think of these as miracles. I don't think them as miracles. I think of them as healings. But there, Jesus is involved in them. But it's not that Jesus is the prime mover of them often. And we'll hear that, especially with Bartimaeus' story, too. So Jesus takes this guy out to kind of be away from everybody in the town and everything. And then spits on his hand I think in one other story he does that he makes some mud and puts it on people's eyes too I'm like well that's the way for them to go blind uh, who knows what was in that mud you know right but he does that and then, well do you see anything I like that idea that Jesus wants to take this person away so it's it's just about them and to really connect with that for Jesus to take his hand not say bring that person to me but take his hand Jesus is connecting to that person in a way. And you think about that when you help someone who doesn't um, see well, walk well, something like that. The joy is your gait slows, doesn't it? You know, I'm like five, seven, five, eight, and I grew up with a father who was six, one. Our job was to keep up you know? And later I found out he and I have the same length of legs, even though we're much different height. And that's why I can keep up. I used to be able to keep up with them with no problem, right? But Jesus, I can just see him slowing down and maybe telling him, you know, I'm going to take you outside of town here. We don't need to be by all these people. You know, what was Jesus telling him? And what was the blind man saying back to Jesus? Was he, was he quiet because he couldn't believe this was happening? Was he there against, kind of against his will, like, you know, somebody led me here? Or did he say, thank you? Oh, I'm so glad to get out of all that noise. Now I can hear you better. Now I can do this. I don't know what they talked about. I don't know if it was the ball game, you know? They could have, right? And then, and then, he feels this wetness on his eyes as Jesus puts his fingers on the man's eyes and then he has him participate. So what do you see? Well, we got to do this together. It's you and I doing healing here. And the guy goes, well, yeah, hmm, I, I think I see people. And then I love the honesty of the guy. He didn't just say, yeah, that's, that's good. I see more than I did. He says, well, they're people, but they look kind of funny, kind of like trees walking. And Jesus, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, let's try this again. He touches his eyes again. And then I love it. Then the man has to look intently. When I said that to the kids, he has to look intently. He has to really focus on something. He has to be part of this. He has to get that brain engaged. You know, if we were talking scientifically here, the, the, um, the scientists would say, you know, all these pathways that got unused for a while are firing again. And the man goes, I can, 
it says he can see clearly, right? Are we that kind of blind? Or do we have moments of that kind of blind? Where we've, we've become blind so, some way and somebody else has had to say, you know what? There's a way to, to see here. There's a way. And they may even show us or bring us to that place. But then we realize nobody else is going to do this and participate in this except for us that we have to be an important part of us. I know we've all had those experiences. I had a, a friend who, it was so clear, he tells this story all the time, he was having massive heart problems. And he went to our friend, a doctor and said, can you cure me? And the doc says, nope, but you can. And that's what Jesus was doing there, is the man was a part of this healing. He had to be honest about what he could say. He had, a, he had to go first when Jesus took him out, outside of, wherever, of everyone else, right? And then he had to be part of it and he had to look intently. He had to focus on that. Is that how you feel? Like you just, the blindness is happening to you in some parts and, and people have, have said, why don't you, you go here? And you feel touched somehow, but you know you've got to work. You've got to make those pathways alive again. I think in our present situation, that's somewhat what happened. I wouldn't say we got lazy or complacent about this, but we are now at a place, we were led to a place where we're going to have to act as people, that people brought us there, whether we wanted to go or not. But the question is, are we going to focus? Are we going to live intently? That's a healing that's present there for us, that we can be a part of, not waiting for somebody else to do it to us. And when we think about it, you know, you know, Jesus spit in the guy's eyes, basically, and then didn't get it right the first time. We need to be part of getting it right, to be known and to work on it. Or maybe are you more like Bartimaeus, right? We got blind Bart. The thing I always say about, and I call him blind Bart all the time, but I'm calling him blind son. Because Bartimaeus is not a name. It's a descriptor. Bar means son. He's son of Timaeus. Why did he never have his own name? If he'd been born blind, you can kind of understand it would have been a tag to remind everybody who his parents were, who his father was that must have done something wrong that you had a blind child. But it says, but when Jesus asks Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus says, I may see again. And that's what leads me to believe, huh? Maybe he wasn't born blind. Something, this happened. The thing is, Bartimaeus is better at being blind than the first guy was. The first guy had to be brought to Jesus, right? Bartimaeus asked, acts as if he can see it all, <laughs> right? He knows where his place is, right? He has staked out a place. I'll bet it is a pretty good begging place too. I'll bet it's right by the gate at the time. There's a lot of people coming and going. You know, the, the, it, it's always good to get people coming out of somewhere. Um, if you think they've got more change on them or if they've just made change about something, right? Because um, if they're going in to get something, oh, you know, they might, yeah, they don't, they're not going to give you money quite yet. It's when they come out, right? I'm sure Bartimaeus had this all down to a science. He also knew like when to speak and when not to speak. It also said he was prepared. He had his cloak because he was sitting in the dust. And can you imagine those roads and just, and you're right by people's feet getting it kicked up. Imagine how many times he got kicked by either humans or animals, if you think about it, or heaven knows what else the animals put on him, right? You know, this was not a good job, but it was Bartimaeus's job. And you could hear, this is what he was going to do, right? And so he heard Jesus coming. Now, I don't know if he knew Jesus' feet, you know, right? But he heard people talking. And he heard what folks were saying. And he knew, oh, Jesus is coming. They're talking about him. 
And so he doesn't wait for an introduction from anyone, does he? Right? He just starts hollering. Did you notice he hollered just the same thing that the woman that we talked about last week, the woman whose child was, um, whose daughter was dying and who Jesus was really racist to and everything. That's how she addressed him. Son of David, have mercy on me. That's how Bartimaeus also addresses him. Talk about, you know, that's the outsiders of the outside at that point. If they're relying on that, because probably a good Jewish person would not say that because they get in trouble with the temple officials, right? But these may have not even been Jewish people that we know the other woman wasn't. Um, she, but she was related, but not, you know, that. But he's hollering out, Jesus, son of David. And everybody tells him to be quiet, hush. They hush him, right? So he shouts out even louder. I like this guy. I like this guy. And then Jesus says, oh, okay, bring him over here. Did he wait for anyone to bring him over there? No. It says he leapt up and threw off his cloak, which is my favorite part of the story. Because can you imagine the state of that cloak? It was filthy, dusty. Can you imagine? And who got covered in that thing when he leapt up and threw off his cloak? I want to know who suddenly found themselves with his filthy cloak over their head. I love it. It was almost like he was just baptizing them with a little bit of cloak, don't you think? And a little dust. And he goes over. And Jesus is kind of like, well, what do you want me to do for you? You know, like, uh, too many people have been asking me things. I want to see again. There was nothing. You know, Bartimaeus went eye to eye, nose to nose with Jesus. I want to see again. And what was Jesus' response? Your faith has made you well. Do we believe that? Jesus takes absolutely no responsibility whatsoever for Bartimaeus seeing. I love this story because I think Bartimaeus was already seeing. He was seeing in different ways and everything. And this was his other way. And when Jesus said, your faith has made you well, Jesus was saying, oh, honey, you see more than I could ever see. Is that maybe the kind of blind that you are right now? Where you're actually seeing more than you think you can see? Well, I'm here to say your faith has made you well. We can already see what we need to see. We can see in ways that are amazing because we see with God's love. That is a healing that is not stuck in words on a page somewhere, but happens again and again in us. We can be all the cast of characters to bring healing to this world. We can bring, be the people that bring somebody that's blind somewhere and say, you know what? You need a good touching, <laughs> you know? You, you need something. We might be the one that says, you know, well, let's get away from this crowd and let's just try to understand each other here and let's give our, each other our best. That's a healing. And maybe it's, when we, when we hear and see something, we just holler out and say, this is it. I'm going to see. What kind of blind are you? And what kind of healing will you not only have, but will you share? Let's pray. Loving God, we can be blinded for so many reasons, but these stories that we have from you don't take into account any of the reasons. It's only about us being intent to see, wanting to see, hollering out and being ready to see. God, you don't condemn us in our blindness. You lead us to new vision. Let us be your people. 
All this we ask in your name. Amen. you, Eric. <laughs> and let's stand together if you're able um, and sing our hymn for everyone born. What I'd like to do on this, I know it goes on for a bit, but it includes so many that we need to remember today. Um, I'd like us to do the first four verses, and then there's two verses printed at the bottom um, on the, that the, after the chorus to sing those, and then we'll go back and pick up verse five. How's that? Does that sound good? Four? The printed version, see the about um, for queer and for straight, for cis and for trans, and then we'll go back to verse five for everyone born. Yeah? All right. Stand if you're able and let's sing.
My goal, y'all, is for us to sing this at the Pride Parade. Beforehand, I found out what was happening. We, while we, where we were waiting and being staged, um, the Dykes on Bikes were there, which you know are near and dear to my heart. You know, and if they knew my last name, they would invite me on their bikes. They would. I'm going to introduce myself next year, but they would rev their and their motors, and it would get really loud, and it was really hard to hear. Found out why they were doing that. They were dr drowning out the street preachers. There was street, a couple street preachers there preaching about, remember Rhonda, I see Rhonda shaking her head and they were preaching salvation and they were preaching out that they were not preaching the good stuff, you guys. They were preaching the exclusion. So I, instead of their, I, and I bless the dykes on bikes and their motors, they drowned them out, you know, he kept doing it, but they drowned them out. And other people went there with signs to, in, his, in his face, you know, but if we go and sing, for God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. So um, the other thing I heard this morning that I have to tell you, did some of you hear this on the radio? It was a minister who said, um, and we are going to fight for this until hell freezes over, and then we are going to fight on the ice. Wasn't that the best? And I thought, amen, sister. You know, she, she, knew, she knew what we were doing, but uh, this is our way to, to live and sing. And all, we do this together because that is what God has called us to, as to amazing individual people, but to be together. And so we gather as a congregation, we gather our gifts so we can be a witness of justice and joy. Gracious God, for all the gifts that we bring, for all the ways you call us to give, for our very lives that we offer to you again and again to be your love. God, we are thankful. See us as we give, hear us as we live. Shape us as we are your people. All this we ask in your name. Amen. If you're standing, you may be seated. And let's join together beginning our prayers with this prayer together, if you'll pray the bold, please. Loving creator, let the rain come and wash away the ancient grudges, the bitter hatreds held and nurtured over generations. Let the rain wash away the memory of the heart and neglect. Then, oh God, let the sun come out and fill the sky with beautiful rainbows. Let the warmth of the sun heal us wherever we are broken. Let it burn away the fog so that each of us can see each other clearly, 
so that we can move beyond labels, beyond accents, gender, sexual orientation, or skin color. Let the warmth and brightness of the sun melt our selfishness so that we can share the joy and sorrow of our neighbors. And the light of the sun be so strong that we'll see all people as our neighbors. Let the earth, nourished by rain, bring forth flowers to surround us with your beauty. And let the mountains teach our hearts to reach upward to heaven. Then, dear God, grant us comfort, give us peace, and allow us strength to enable us to stand up, fight for, and be a voice for equality. Loving God, as we read and pray these words this morning, we know we have a journey ahead of us. That we here may be people and understand that we are in a safe place here because we value similar things. But we know, God, that we have a lot of work to do in this world and that the safe place is not the only place that we are called to. We are called to make safe places where all may thrive, where all may see that they are the beautiful colors, the flowers, the mountains, all that is in celebration of you. God, forgive us when we set this world up to be winners and losers, where things are decided and then others must acquiesce. God, forgive us for using the power of our work together as people to make others less, to curtail their futures and their choices. God, forgive us when we forget that our life here is about working on the hard questions that will never fully be answered, but it is our work that is holy. It is the ground that we stand on when we engage together that is holy. For you, God, are there. God, send us to many places, to many people. Teach us to have conversations where we can really hear each other, where we can see the touch that others need when we too can be touched ourselves. God, let us cry out for the healing that we need and work intently for it in so many places. God, on this last Sunday of Pride Month, we think especially of our LGBTQ plus siblings who are so concerned, who have been through so much just to be at the day that they are, where they are today, and yet know that they are being targeted, they are being singled out, they are being told that they are less than. God, may we raise up our voices and songs and our actions even louder so that what is heard instead is love. May we listen to them and hear their stories. May we not stop, God, in being your people. And we pray, God, this morning for all those who find themselves pregnant in a time and a place where they cannot be. God, it is a hard decision to make and God, you give us many hard decisions to make, but with you, we can make them. Together, we can make them. God, be with them as they're feeling a pit in their stomach, their heart racing, their future closing. God, may they know there are ways and may we be part of them in the days to come. May we rejoice with people in whatever decision they have made. And may we see your face on their face. And loving God, we think of those that are going out to a new phase of their life now. We think especially of those heading out to their college or their next place 
We think of those in our congregation who are taking that next step. And you pray that you, we pray that you be with them and their families as things will change now. May people find you and see you in the changes that are coming. May they see so many opportunities in their future for them to be your love in this world. God, indeed, be with them, be with us as we work on that together. God, for those among us who are seeking healing, may they know your touch and your presence as they cry out to you. For all of those around us who have yet to find their voice, God, you know their needs. May we also. God, hear us as we do this most radical thing. Join our voices together in praise of you. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, parent of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us, in the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us, in times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And this is another song that I'd like us to know without out the words um, eventually as a congregation. It's by Holly Near. Do some of you know this? We are a gentle, angry people. Stand if you're able and let's sing this together. Pardon me? Yes.
I challenge you this week to find a place where you can sing at least one of those verses in some place where people need to know that we are singing for all lives. And as we sing now, as we sing then, as we sing together always, God's peace will be with us now and always. Amen.